All right, welcome back. Hopefully you've already watched a lesson on how to calculate these basic cash flows in a short and simple way. But now we're gonna look at some more examples and these are gonna be a little bit more complex than the ones in the lesson. And so if you decide to watch this video, I'm really glad because these are gonna be very helpful for the types of different problems that you may see while going through this course. So let's start with the example right here. We have Max makes a deposit into an account earning 7% compound interest per year on the 1st of January in 2016. He makes a withdrawal of $50 on the 1st of January in 2018 and a deposit of $250 on the 1st of January in 2019. The amount in his account on the 1st of January in 2020 is $1,193.35. What was Max's initial deposit on the 1st of January in 2016? So this is a little more complicated in that we weren't given a value that we had been given previously. We usually always knew what the initial deposit was. And so this is where this class can get a little tricky because it expects you to do some algebra. You have to set things up, solve for a value, and that's really how they make problems harder here. You're given a familiar scenario and they don't give you something that you're used to getting. And then you gotta figure out, well, how do I get that? So that's what we're gonna do here. So as I always recommend, we start these problems by drawing out a timeline and place all of our known transactions on it. So let's start with our first transaction, which happens to be a deposit made in 2016. Now, we are not told what the amount of that deposit is, so I'm just gonna write x. We're gonna write that variable x because we're gonna actually solve for that later on. And then let's go to our next transaction, which would be in 2018. So I'll write that. And in this case, we are withdrawing $50. So we will subtract 50. And then let's go to our next transaction, which would be in 2019. And in 2019, we are depositing $250. So plus 250. And then we are told that the amount in the account at the beginning of 2020, we will have $1,193.35. And now we wanna know what is this initial deposit X? So let's pretend that we didn't know what this was and let's just set up our equation as we normally would. So let's say we did know what our initial deposit was. We would write the future value is equal to that initial deposit times one plus the interest rate, which in this case, let's see, it is 7% compound interest per year, so that would be equal to 0 0.07. So we'll go over here and write 0 0.07. In fact, I'm gonna change this to 1.07 because hopefully it's obvious that one plus 0.7 is just 1.07. And then we need to see how long this is in our account. We are in 2016 and there are two years between 2016 and 2018. There's one year between 2018 and 2019 and another year between 2019 and 2020. So we're in here for a total of four years because two plus one plus one is four. So we're going to be calculating that for a total of four years. Then we're gonna be subtracting our withdrawal of $50. And how many years do we need to compound that for? Well, we have one here and one here. So total of two, so 1.07 squared. And that was because there are two years on the timeline after that withdrawal was made. Then we need to take into account our deposit of $250. So we'll add plus 250. And then how long is this in? Well, just one year. So 1.07. And that would be the first power, but we don't really need to write that. So now typically we would be able to plug all of this in a calculator and then we would find our future value. But we don't know what this initial deposit is, but we do know what the future value is at the beginning of 2020. So we can actually plug that in where this future value is. And so I'm gonna do that. We have 1,193.35 cents. So then this essentially becomes an algebra equation. We just have to solve for x. We have one term with an x and the rest of these are all constant values. So if we just add them together, we can actually solve this pretty easily. So I'm gonna go ahead and simplify this by plugging some things into a calculator. I'm not gonna bother with this part right here. I'm gonna leave that as it is. But then we would have here minus 57.245, and that would continue on. I'm just gonna cut off the decimals there. But when you calculate these, do not round. Be sure to save those values in your calculator and then bring them back when you're doing your full calculation. Because if you do round your calculations, you might end up with an incorrect answer at the end, which you want to avoid at all costs.
So this is what we get if we plug this into the calculator. And then the next term would be 267.5. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these and then I'm going to subtract them from this. Again, just basic algebra techniques. I don't believe I need to go through all of those steps because at this point you should be pretty well aware on how to do that. So then we're going to have $983.10 is equal to x times 1.07 to the fourth power. And then all we have to do is divide this by this in our calculator, and then we can get that x is equal to $750. And so that's our answer here. We now know that in 2016, Max deposited $750, and he let that accumulate interest even though he took out some money and added some more in. This is what he ended up with, but we were able to figure out what he started with by setting up this basic cash flow equation. Now for our second example, and this is the only other example in this video, it's, it's quite involved, so I think this will really give you an idea on how to use the basic cash flow calculation to its fullest potential. And this is the type of problem that you might see on an exam that would test you on this kind of material. It's got the basic idea, but it's also got a little twist thrown in there to try to throw you off. But in reality, it's actually not too difficult once you understand what's happening. So let's look at it. Connor deposits $5,000 into an account paying a compound interest rate of 3%. So let's quickly write that. It's per year, so our interest rate is equal to 3% and that is equal to 0 0.03. Let's continue reading. The account's paying a compound interest rate of 3% per year for a total of 10 years. The account has a restriction that if Connor makes a withdrawal within the first four and one half years, his account will be charged a penalty of 6% of the withdrawal. Yikes. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's continue reading. Despite this, Connor withdraws an amount K at the end of each year's two, three, five, and eight. The balance in his account at the end of the 10th year is $5,000. Find K. So this is really involved, but it's nothing that we can't do. It's just Connor has this amount in his account. He then makes some withdrawals. And then how much does he have at the end? So it's nothing different except for this penalty that's going on, right? We have this restriction that if he makes a withdrawal within a certain amount of time, he's going to lose a little bit more money out of his account. So how do we start this? Well, you always start these problems the same way. You draw that timeline. In this case, we know that we're working with a total of 10 years right off the bat. It says 3% per year for a total of 10 years. So I'm going to draw out a timeline that takes into account each of those 10 years. So we'll draw our starting point, and I'm gonna go all the way over here to our 10th year. So this is going to be t equals zero and t equals 10. Then I'm going to divide this up. So this would be t equals five in the middle. And then I will split it up here. So this is six, seven, eight, and nine. And this is four, three, two, one. And so each one of those tick marks on the timeline represents a year in the future, such as t equals one, t equals two, all the way up to t equals 10, which would be 10 years from today. So then I'm only going to label the years of interest here. So we've got each one labeled technically with these tick marks on our timeline, but in particular, we are interested in years two, three, five, and eight when he makes withdrawals. So we'll label time equals two, time equals three, we already have time equals five labeled, and then time equals eight. So what happens at each one of these points that we have labeled? Well, at time equals zero, he deposited $5,000. So we'll write that. Nothing happens in year one. We're not told about anything in the first year, so we'll leave that blank. But in year two, he withdraws an amount K. So we will write minus K. Then in the third year, he also withdraws that amount K. So we'll do that again. He also does it in year five, and he also does it in year eight. So then we also know that the amount in his account at the end of the 10th year is also $5,000. So we'll write that there as well. So he starts with $5,000 and ends with 5,000, which is an interesting part of this problem for sure. So now let's work on calculating this. How do we set this up? So we know that the future value at the end of this whole 10 years, this whole time period, is this $5,000 here. So we'll see that that $5,000 is equal to, and now we can work through our basic cash flows. We started with $5,000, and we're going to compound that for 10 years, right? We 
have a total of 10 years on our timeline, and our interest rate is 0 0.03, so we should write 1.03 to the 10th power. All right, I moved some of my numbers over because I realized I was probably going to run out of room if I didn't do that. So now let's work on our first transaction, which happens at t equals 2. And at t equals 2, we are withdrawing an amount k. So we'll write minus k, and now we have to keep track of that for the whole time that this takes place within the time frame that we are interested in. And so from time equals two to time equals 10, we have a total of eight years in between there. So we would multiply by 1.03 to the eighth power. Now we're not done, because if you remember, there's a penalty. He has this restriction that his account will be penalized with 6% of the withdrawal if he withdraws within the first four and one half years. So let's mark that actually on our timeline. So the first four and a half years would take us to one, two, three, four and a half. So right here. So I'm gonna draw a little line right here and then we're gonna cover this in that red mark. And what that means is that anytime we withdraw within this period here, we're gonna to have to pay an extra 6% of our withdrawal. So because of that, we have to penalize this value. And so if we want to be charged a penalty of 6%, we have to add another 6% to that withdrawal. So if you remember, the whole reason that we multiply by this interest rate is that it takes 3% of our withdrawal and then adds it to the withdrawal, right? It's like when we deposited, remember, if we deposited $100 and our interest rate was 5%, we would have five more dollars, and then our account would have $105 in it at the end of that period. So if we wanna have a penalty of a 6%, we have to include that into our amount. We don't wanna just multiply our withdrawal by 6%, that would get us less than the withdrawal. We have to include that withdrawal as well, so we have to multiply it by 1.06, if that makes sense. We don't want just the amount that's penalized, we want to include the entire amount of the withdrawal and that penalty, just like we want to include the entire amount of this withdrawal and the interest. We don't want just the interest, we want the withdrawal and the interest, and we also want this penalty. Well, we don't want the penalty, but we have to take it into account when we do this calculation. So we multiply this by 1.06, and we don't have to worry about compounding that. We don't have to take this to an eighth power. That would be incorrect. We don't want to do that because it's a one-time penalty. You're not penalized every year for eight years. You're penalized once for each one of those withdrawals within those 4.5 years. But each withdrawal is still compounded with the interest for the amount of years that it's in the timeline. So now we move on to our next transaction. At t equals three, we again have another withdrawal of k. So we write that. And now this is going to be compounded for seven years from t equals three to t equals 10. So we have our 1.03 to the eighth power. Now, does this take place within the time that we're gonna get penalized? Yep, it does. So we have to multiply this by 1.06. Next, I'm gonna to have to write below this. I'm really running out of room. We're gonna look at our next transaction at t equals five. So we're gonna subtract another withdrawal of k, and this one is going to be compounded for five years from t equals five to t equals 10. So 1.03 to the fifth power. And now does this take place within our penalty period? No, it takes place after it, right? For the first four and one half years. This is year five, so we don't have to worry about it. So we can move on to our next withdrawal at year eight, which would be another subtraction of K times 1.03. And this time we are compounding for just two years from year eight to year 10. So now we've got it all set up. This was the hardest part. The hardest part was just setting it up and figuring out what to do with that penalty because that penalty can be a little confusing. Your natural thing to do is to just say, oh, we'll multiply this by 0 0.06 and oh wait, do I need to do it eight times? You know, it can get a little confusing. You can, you can really confuse yourself trying to think about how to handle that. But just think of it as the penalty is something that you have to add on to the withdrawal, but only one time. You don't have to do it more than once. So now we can solve this like an algebra equation. It's just like the previous example, we were solving for x. In this case, we're solving for k. It's gonna be a little bit more difficult because we have several k's to work with, right? We have one here and here and here and here, but they're all the same power, right? It's just k. So once we figure out what these coefficients are for k, we can add all the k values together and make this easier to solve. So let's work on solving this now. We still have our 5,000 equal 
to 5,000 times 1.03 to the 10th power. And then if I calculate this portion in the calculator, I will get minus 1.343, I'm rounding there, K. Remember, do not round when you actually calculate in the calculator. I just don't want to write a bajillion different decimals on this screen. I want to be able to show you all the different parts. So then we're going to subtract the next part, which would be this right here. And that's going to be negative 1.304K. And then we're subtracting this portion, which would be negative 1.159K. And then we have to subtract this portion, which would be 1.061K. And then we can add up all those like terms. And we'll have 5,000 equals, and I plugged this in the calculator now this time, and we'll have 6,719 and 58 cents minus 4.867K. Remember, that's rounded, but don't actually round when you calculate this. And so then if we subtract this value from here, and then we divide by this negative 4.867, we can find our value for K. So algebraically, K would equal $353.34. And that is how much Connor withdrew each time he made a withdrawal. That is what we found there. It may have seemed a little complicated, but in the end, it's all about setting up that timeline and then setting up your basic cash flows equation, making sure to take any extra calculations, such as a penalty, into consideration. So that's all I had for these practice examples to go along with lesson two. I think this is a pretty good introduction to using basic cash flows and setting up equations based on a timeline and using that to find what you need to find. And being able to set up those equations is a very important skill that you have to develop. So with that, that's all I have. But if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I will see you next time.